brought up in a, in a religious home. A home where they knew what it meant to be born again, really have a change of heart. And they expected all of us to have one, too. <laughs> However, I uh, remember that I was in evangelistic campaign sometimes, and they'd ask if I was a Christian, and my mother would say, oh, yes, she is. And I wasn't so sure about it, <laughs> because I knew that uh, I needed a born-again experience. And so one day in a little meeting at a neighborhood church, I, uh, uh, there was an evangelist, and when they asked those who wanted to be saved and go to the altar, I went to the altar. I had a real feeling of conviction and sorrow for my sins and asked God to forgive me, and a great peace flooded my heart. And I knew that Jesus Christ had come into my heart. I was sure then that I was saved. I used to love missionary work from the time I was a little girl. Even before this experience, I thought, oh, I want to be a missionary. And uh, I really had that before me all the years of my girlhood. But uh, I said, I can't be a missionary, because even though I knew I had been born again, there were things in my life that I didn't approve of. <laughs> I didn't feel like I was living victoriously like I should. And I very, very much wanted to live a victorious Christian life, a life full of joy and without the reactions that come, the carnal reactions that often come to us. We had a man from the East, Dr. R.C. McQuilkin, who taught to just let go and let God, and it was a real thrilling thing. It was a new experience that Christ was going to take over, and I knew that he would give me the victory. I wanted to be a missionary in Africa. I always said I wanted to be a missionary in Africa, but it was at the time of that terrible depression, and the missionaries were coming back from the field instead of being sent out. Nobody was being sent out much. So I thought I would just uh, teach for a year. I'd finished university by that time, and I thought I'd just teach for a year. And then I went to a Bible class I attended, and my teacher said, uh, Joy, are you going to the mission field now? You're finishing university. And I said, oh, I, I think I'll teach for a year and make enough money so that I can go. And uh, she says, oh, don't you realize that if you wait, it may be too late for some of those people. And uh, I said, oh, and then I began thinking, of course I wouldn't want that to happen. And I asked God to open the way. I said, I'll go any place, any country where you open the way. And uh, so some people came to me from the little community church that I was attending and asked if I would be interested in going to Honduras and uh, that there was an opening. They did so much need someone to go. And all I could say was, yes, I'll go. So within a few months, I was on my way to Honduras. I was in Honduras just under six years, and uh, I had a great experience. I was up in the mountains. I had to go alone because there weren't enough, there was no one to go with me. I knew it was a very dangerous place. The missionaries that had been in there before just couldn't stay because there were murders and wars and difficulties of so many kinds that it was dangerous. But I had such a call and such a desire to go to those people. There were a few believers already, and uh, I longed to go. And so I remember going mule back for several days and getting up to that mountain place. And a national girl who hadn't ever been to school, she had learned to read somehow, and she was to be my helper, met me on the way, and uh, that's where I worked most of those years. Eventually, I realized that I couldn't go back, and so the mission also would not have let me go back because uh, doctors couldn't seem to find really what was wrong with me, and if they did, it was easy to correct. It seemed as if I might be this way all my life. I didn't know, but the Lord brought me to the place again that he had done so many times to rejoice. He brought it through his word. He says, no, uh, trust in the Lord, and he's uh, going to look after you. And then he made it so clear that I was to rejoice. He's going to do something great. I didn't know what it was. I didn't think it involved me. But my part was just to trust him and believe him. 
And so, although I had known to rejoice in difficulties and hardships and poverty and persecutions and war and things of that kind, I had to really apply it now to this, even though it looked as if I'd be an invalid for life or a semi-invalid. And as I was thinking about it, I remembered that people down in the uh, field had these hand wine, uh, hand crank motor gramophones. And I thought, well, if we only had records. There was one in the mission, but we couldn't use it. There was nothing in Spanish and certainly nothing of the gospel. And then I began to think, oh, if I could just make some records and send those down, they could be hearing the gospel and the people that were not saved were not Christians, so they could hear too. I didn't have a clue as to how records could be made. I didn't know anything about it. I thought you could go and buy a little machine and make records and send them down. and would never have done it all. They wouldn't have played on a, on a little ordinary motor-driven gramophone. But I uh, met a man one day, and we were talking. And he says, what are you thinking of doing? And I said, well, I want to make records. He said, do you know how you're going to make them? I said, well, I know I don't. He says, well, I know a man. And he said, uh, he has just built up a real professional studio in his home. He's a physics professor, and he's made a very fine, high-fidelity studio. Oh, I was thrilled, and I went out there as quickly as I could. And I think it was uh, a joy to him, too, a real, because he hardly knew where, how he was going to use it. He had a position in a university teaching, and uh, here I was and telling him of my vision of sending records down to Latin America, and he was interested, too. So he said, here it is. The equipment's all set up. When do you want to start? And so I got Spanish-speaking people together to go out and arrange uh, the plan for scripts and singing and uh, so forth. And you can't imagine the thrill the first night that uh, recordings were made. And to hear it come back with beautiful fidelity, you know, and the message so clear and so beautiful and the singing so, so good. Oh, I was just, just simply thrilled. It just seemed like uh, the sky had just <laughs> opened up before me. I just uh, was so happy about it. I was alone when I first started. I didn't have any workers. And in fact, we weren't even organized at that time. But this was the beginning. And of course, when records went down, people were very excited about it. And I got letters back, and someone said, do you think anyone could be converted through hearing a record? And I said, well, I've never heard of it, but I believe they can. I've heard of people that have been converted through uh, reading a tract. And uh, it wasn't long before we began to hear of some who had accepted the Lord. Uh, there was a call from Mexico to uh, make records in another language. And they couldn't get permission to get them up to the United States, these Indians. They tried and tried. It was so important to them to have these records. And I figured out if it's that important for them to want to bring up a, a bunch of people 3,000 miles to make records, why shouldn't we go down? So we took the uh, radio tone recorder and off we went in the car to Mexico, Central America. We recorded in that one year in about 32 languages, Indian languages. Wonderful part that the results were just wonderful. Many, many souls, hundreds and hundreds of souls were saved as a result of those very records. But then uh, when I came to Los Angeles, I thought, well, now we've done it. But we heard of need in Alaska, so, well, we said we have to go there too. So we drove all the way up to Alaska, just at the end of the Second World War there, in, uh, and uh, we got up there and made records in many languages. Uh, we had uh, our first tape recorder at that time. That was a great help. And while we were in Alaska, somebody said, you know, there are a lot of languages over in the Philippine Islands. And I thought, 
Oh, my. I wish you hadn't told us that. Now we've got to go to the Philippine Islands. But we did. Anne Sherwood went with me, and we went over to the Philippine Islands and worked for a solid year. And then we had a recorder made by our own, uh, our own men at Gospel Recordings. It was growing by then, and people were coming, stepping out, and giving their time, their lives, to the work. And so in that one year, we made 92 languages. And uh, then the other workers came to us, and we spread out. We'd be working simultaneous in different countries. The Lord marvelously answers prayer and has brought people of very great ability to us. And we praise him for that. One of the things that we have uh, desired in the work, not only to make these records, but that people, Christian people, could know that we have a God that's alive who answers prayer. God has taken care of us and we're happy and we love our work. And God has brought many, many, many thousands of souls to believe in him. And little churches have sprung up <laughs> in different places. And when you realize that we've been able to go from country to country and meet tribes that have never been face to face with a foreigner before or any outside person, and to be able to sit down and have the techniques to be able to get gospel messages from people that have never even seen an outsider before. It's only the Lord that could do that. We've a message to give to the nations that the Lord 